introduction and thank you to Anna and Adrian for inviting me today. Um, and it's great to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience. And I'd just like to kick off by firstly acknowledging that I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to anyone um, from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent who are present here today. So today's talk um, draws heavily on a forthcoming paper, Curating in the Wild, which I've co-authored with Nicola Malave and Gaia Tadone as part of the Swiss funded project Curating Photography in the Networked Image Economy. Um, and it's a paper in need of feedback, so I welcome any comments. So as Anna mentioned, in 2011, I joined the Photographer's Gallery as its first digital curator a new post established to help the institution deal with the tsunami of bastardized, automated, authorless networked images, which were redefining photography and undermining models of cultural value on which the photographic um, medium uh, was finding its place in the canon of art. And at that time, the director of the gallery was saying, um, you know, the that the curators were needed more than ever to help make sense of this tsunami. And over the following decade, decade we responded to this suggested retreat to cultural or curatorial authority by focusing not on images, but imaging systems and embarked on a mission to unpack the socio-technological apparatus of photography, partnering with colleagues at the Center for the Study of the Networked Image, South Bank University. And crucial to our project was an emphasis on the cultural significance of software infrastructure and computation, which was cannibalizing and operationalizing photographic representation. So from 2015, we focused our energies increasingly on understanding ways of machine seeing as a counterpoint to the gallery's embrace of visual literacy models built on slow looking semiotic and, and semiotic analysis. And in 2016, we appointed Nicola Malave as a PhD researcher who began a practice led investigation into the algorithms of vision, part of which involved a reperformance of a 2007 machine learning experiment by Fei Fei Li and colleagues, which underpins um, the model of vision that uh, such as uh, data sets, canonical, canonical data sets such as ImageNet. And I'm pleased to report that in 2019, under the guise of a 10th birthday party of ImageNet, we lured her into the gallery in order to sit her own experiment with Nicholas's oversight. So as a photo institution operating on a Kunsthal model, we were free to approach AI not as a tool, but as a cultural form and fundamentally photographic project grounded in the labor of the amateur photographer, photo sharing platforms, and the imaginaries of the photographic archive. And in 2019, we launched Dataset Match, a year long program of events, workshops, and commissions, exploring the technical, cultural, and social significance of image data sets. And as part of this project, we positioned the computer scientist as an increasingly significant curator of visual culture, an actor participating in an emerging curatorial ecosystem, which includes social media users and influencers, amateur photographers, data scientists, and software agents engaged, engaged in practices of data collection and visualization, sorting and selection of content, recommendation, labeling and tagging of images. So rather than speak today about how artists are using data sets, I want to discuss how questions of aesthetic value, quality, taste, and curating have become the concerns of computer sciences. And whilst the image processing community has been focused on image quality for over 40 years, the image tsunami I previously described has also generated an accelerated interest in aesthetics of photographs to ensure the survival of the fittest image. So because machine vision depends on the availability of training data to perform curatorial tasks, it requires the curation of impressive amounts of photos upstream. And until recently, data sets for machine vision were produced either in-house by engineers who would take their own photos or commission professional photo shoots. With the scaling up of popular online image production, computer scientists turned to the internet. And key data sets such as Pascal VOC, ImageNet or Coco draw extensively from the resources offered by photo sharing platforms. And data sets from the last decade collected a significant portion, if not the entirety 
of their contents from Flickr, making amateur photography a defining trait of machine vision's photographic culture. Search engines have been another popular source of visual samples as they reached a variety of images with a single query. And this switch from self-made photos and photo shoots to Flickr albums and search results made the networked image the de facto object of interest for machine vision. Therefore, the curation of the networked image gradually became an epistemic problem for the discipline of computer vision. And in this regard, the appearance of the term curation in computer vision's literature is illuminating. Since the mid 60s, computer vision scientists have relied on data sets that were said to be assembled or built, not curated. And in the tech startup world, the rhetoric of aesthetic modernism now creeps into the discussion of the data set. As Apu Shaji, IAM's former head of R&D suggests, a well curated data set captures the form and features and the algorithms are the chisels and hammers that aid in carving out the fine details. The personalized component of our algorithm allows photographers to gain access to the necessary tools to discover, define and share his or her artistic identity or even taste with the larger audience. So what is this ground truth on which this aesthetic judgment is established? In the field of aesthetic computing, it is not Turkish, but photographic communities who have become unacknowledged sources of otherwise expensive ground truth data, which help train classification models. Their comments, ratings and likes offer technologists an inexpensive way to harvest aesthetic judgments by a community who can be described in the literature as vested critics and prolific consumers and end users of AI's product, products. With this in mind, there is a growing canon of data sets sourced from photographic websites that include photo.net, dpchallenge.net, Flickr Behance, and more recently, guruShots.com. One of the first platforms for aesthetic evaluation of images, Aquine, was made um, possible through the creation of a data set scraped from photo.net an online photo community website started in 1997, also by an MIT computer scientist. And this is something in our interviews with computer scientists in the field we see, often they're talking about wanting to provide the solution as amateur photographers to other amateur photographers to learn how to develop the aesthetic value of their work and tools like um, Aquine become a kind of magnanimous gesture um, through which they can give back to this uh, community. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to these ratings, aesthetic value is quantified and decomposed into mathematical elements based on formal tropes, such as the rule of thirds, saturation, hue, and texture. And through this process, uh, a tool like Aquine became trained in the systems of judgment, preferred subjects, and technical approaches of camera club photography which traditionally seeks legitimation not as art or as social practice, but through the generation of its own creative boundaries sanctioned by its community. Nonetheless, Aquine's creators celebrated photo.net and the data set they created as a source of peer reviewed image evaluations from a relatively diverse group averaged out over the entire spectrum of amateurs to serious professionals. Given its origins, it is probably not surprising that Aquine caused much consternation amongst users by giving more fav favorable ratings to landscape photography as opposed to photos depicting people. So in this sense, it's important to uh, acknowledge that in addition to data set curation, machine learning is also producing a field of automated curation. And in the image marketplace, AI curation is set to be the next killer app and tech startup IAM promises their iVision algorithm can deliver on-demand curation and can do just what photo curators do, but within milliseconds. Whilst Visco celebrates its AI Ava, who can look at art just like a human. And this of course is, is all in the aid at the interface to help consumers choose which images to share online. And I think it's interesting to reflect on this basis that the amateur photographer, becomes the ground truth and authority on which aesthetic value is determined, but also paradoxically seen as um, deficient and an audience that needs to be uh, aesthetically disciplined and in need of training and guidance. Um, so it creates this kind of interesting aesthetic bubble. 
Um, and in fact, I think you might have seen the aesthetic critique uh, captioning data set is a data set that actually um, takes reviews from professional photographers in order to gener auto generate critique of photos um, in that respect. So I am is actually a particularly fascinating example of how discourses of democratization and community, education and empowerment, curation and expertise has escaped the museum and become operationalized in computational culture. Founded in 2010, IAM has built their user base from Berlin through festivals, workshops, exhibitions, parties, photo contests, and partnerships with Getty, Alamein, and Apple. They strategically position themselves in opposition to the manicured visual trash of Instagram, championing photographers and supporting them to improve their skills. This was followed by a move to effectively monetize the platform in 2014, when IAM began to license user content to the global brands. A year later, they bought the machine vision startup site.io and, and launched IM iVision, a computer vision framework able to rank image aesthetics and recognize concepts built on deep learning. And today, IM automatically captions and keywords each photo uploaded by a user, but also can rank them, giving them a score from zero to 100. So, depending on your position, IM is either a photographic community a stock photography marketplace or an AI company. And it's interesting how these, these, these things blur. However, as a business, there are various mechanisms of value extraction at work. And in its role as an intermediary between photographers and the stock photography um, industry, IAM's commercial survival depends on its success as a curatorial interface which matches brands with visual stock. Their developers take trained aesthetic models and mix them to reflect the client's brand identity in a process likened to a DJ mixing different music, adjusting balance for a specific brand. And this same curatorial technology has been sold by IM to LG to enhance the AI capacities of their camera phones. Crucially, what is extracted here is the value of the techn technological development of taste resulting from the collaboration with photographers, curators and stock agencies. And this relation consolidated in a software product finds its way into new devices where it automatically adjusts camera parameters, optimizes photo shoots and assists phone users in their daily tasks of photo creation and curation. In this sense, IAM's curatorial pipeline mobilizes a narrative of creativity and curatorial care which camouflages the underlying mechanisms of value extraction at play. Because users feel taken care of, are given exposure and their content is respected and celebrated, they upload images to the platform and benefit from passive income from sales to stock agency. And IAM positions itself as providing a space where what matters is sharing a passion for photography, far from the hostile environments where ad tech controlling has become the norm. And CTO uh, Ramsey Rook insists that user data is not stored in the cloud and is not sold with social media giants like Instagram or Google. And there is an awareness of the toxicity of the scale at which tech giants operate, yet I am also cannot operate outside of it. Curation must scale and I am represents an attempt to address this issue without turning into an ad platform. The monetization of user photographic production through and rating through the sale to stock in agencies is an attempt to find a relatively transparent solution to this problem. I am a photo sharing platform is also a business. Yet, um, we would argue there is a dimension of camouflage in this also. The I am community is addressed constantly as a community of creatives, of enthusiasts eager to break rules. This community is never addressed as the producers of samples for data sets or aesthetic fodder for algorithms. What allows IAM to scale up is not only their relationship with partners like Jetty, Getty, but also their ability to, to develop technical product, products that congeal the curatorial dynamics of the platform into automated procedures. IAM stops short of educating its users or confronting them with the multiple levels of their interaction with the platform or their intimate relation with the agents that pay, 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 partake in the curation. So to conclude, what arises from this is a contaminated, contaminated curatorial discourse, which can be mobilized to camouflage problems of scale and accountability, 
or sustain narratives of quality and aesthetic value. And in these examples, the historical paradigm of curating as care can be operationally disavowed, yet selectively deployed as uh, evidence of a safer ambience, a healthier atmosphere, or a more personalized experience. The curatorial pipeline, something is always also something else. A photograph is always also data, a service is also a product, and a community is also a ground truth, and a relation is also an asset. So having traced the flight of the photographic, um, the flight of photographic pedagogy and curation from the museum to the tech startup, I just want to return to the photo museum and whose historical purpose has been to educate, celebrate and, the promote, and promote an understanding of photographic culture. And in doing so, I want to draw on the insights of Nicola Malave, who in his PhD thesis concludes that computer vision has failed to produce an understanding of the complexity of the very object it claims to be able to interpret the photograph. And I would join him in arguing that there is a crucial role for the photo museum in providing a context where computer vision's mode of knowledge production, the effects of epistemic boundaries and exclusions can be probed collectively. And that is the end.